Hello YouTube, I'm here to give my testimony about all so many wonderful things that God has done in my life. Um, I accepted Christ as my Savior when I was five years old. I grew up in the church. I was blessed to be part of a Christian family. But like so many children who grow up in Christian homes, when they get around the wrong people, they backslide. They become the prodigal child. And I was no different. I spent my teenage years partying and drinking and doing things that nobody should ever do. Um, and then I got married and I settled down. And I had two kids. But when my divorce happened, my whole world fell apart. I still wasn't holding on to God. I'd go to church periodically, yeah, sure. But I wasn't really walking with him. I was just kind of doing my own thing and working really hard and taking care of my family. But then when me and my ex-husband separated, I couldn't take it. I couldn't handle it. I worked three jobs to try to fill the gap. Um, he had my kids for a while and that just tore me apart. I didn't know what to do about it, any of that. I got to where I was going to the bar five nights a week to play bar poker. And then the other two nights, you know, of course, that's Friday and Saturday night. So you're out there dancing and partying and drinking and doing Lord knows what. Usually nothing good. And at home, I would go home and I would cry and I would cry out to God. God, help me. I can't do this. I can't take it. I need your help and I don't know what to do. On the floor in tears crying. Telling God, I know I've screwed up. I know I've messed up. I need your help. I can't handle this. It got so bad at one point, I even tried to take my own life. I OD'd on some heart medication of mine and cut both my wrists. If it wasn't for my sister and my brother-in-law who lived at the house with me at the time, I wouldn't be here today. I would have died that day. My sister comes in and sees the blood. And by the grace of God, we had friends that lived next door that was an EMT. And he come over and I remember him hit me on my chest real hard and I sat up and I was like, what? And then back to sleep I went. I spent three days in ICU over that. They weren't sure I was gonna live. Then of course, you know, the trip to the psych ward in which I realized I need to get back with God and where I need to be. My problem isn't so much a depression problem as a spiritual problem. And then it still didn't stop me from going to the bar. I was still going to the bar trying to fill the gap because I didn't know what to do. And I had a friend stop me one night and say, Jackie, you sure are drinking an awful lot. And I said, no, I'm not. And as soon as I said that, God convicted me and a light switch flipped in my head and said denial is the first sign of a problem. And I stopped and I thought about how much I drank. I walked over, put the drink down on the bar, grabbed Red Bull and kept on hanging out with my friends at the bar. I still drank every now and again after that. God slowly took that away completely. I haven't had a drop of drink in years. I praise God for that because if it wasn't for that, I'd be an alcoholic like my father and my grandfather were. But that's not where the real miracle begins, though it's always a miracle when God steps in to do things in our lives. So, I became a sober chauffeur for my friends pretty much all the time. And one Thursday night, back in 2006, I was a sober chauffeur for my friend again that night. I took him out to one bar, then we went to a different bar, and we met up with some friends there. They decided, well, after the bar's closed, we'll meet up at our friend's house and we'll go out to a creek party and a bunch of us will meet out there. I said, okay. That's what he wanted to do. So that's what I, I took my friend. We met up with our friends at their house. And we got, something told me I should just go home, but I didn't listen. And then I was like, well, I don't really have the gas. And they said, well, you could ride with us. I said, okay. And so I got in their Chevy Blazer and off down 
This gravel road we drove, we went. The gravel road's name was Zion Road, and by this time it was early morning Good Friday. I didn't know the name of the road at the time, and I didn't realize till a short time later that it was Good Friday. Well, it would be longer than a short time, probably about a month or so, that it was Good Friday at the time of my accident. But we got in the car, and about three quarters of a mile down this gravel road, the one drunk friend talks his sober buddy into saying, hey, let me drive, dude. I haven't driven in a while, but let me drive. And his friend said, all right, you can drive. And I, sitting in the back seat, said, that is not a good idea. Something bad's going to happen. And they tried to reassure me and say, nothing bad's going to happen, Jackie, just it's going to be all right. Don't worry about it. I said, I am worried about it. Something bad's going to happen. You're drunk and you don't need to be driving. Well, of course, we were all 23 at the time. And I don't know of very many 23-year-olds that listen all that great. And I don't know of any drunks that listen very good. So, I lost that battle. I didn't get out of the car either. We were out in the middle of BFE, if you know what I mean. And... That at 2 o'clock in the morning didn't sound like a plausible thought to me. In hindsight, it probably would have been a better thought than what happened. But anyway, down the gravel road we went. About two miles down this gravel road, we rolled this Chevy Blazer 185 feet going 55 miles an hour around the corner. The driver, who begged to drive, was thrown out first. Me sitting in the back seat. I remember flipping around the vehicle. I remember hitting the window with my head. I remember hitting the ground. I remember opening up my eyes and that panic feeling you feel right after an accident when you're like, oh, is everything okay? Well, I did that, but everything wasn't okay. I couldn't move. I couldn't move an inch. I couldn't do anything but talk at that point. Praise God I could do that. I was calm. I wasn't scared. I remember my only fear being at that time I didn't want to be in a wheelchair the rest of my life. God's got a funny sense of humor sometimes, I think. But the friend that was riding with me, he stayed in the vehicle the whole time. He climbed out the back glass of the blazer and over to me ran. Asking, Jackie, Jackie, are you okay? And me saying, no, don't move me. My neck is broke. And he's asking, where are we at? Where are we at? I said, I don't know. We were going down to Lesh Creek. And that's all I knew of the place at the time. Because I grew up around there, but I didn't know the name of the road. And he was calling 911. And I asked him who was laying to the right of me. He told me it was our friend, G. And I said, and Dominic said, Jackie, he's not doing good. He's not doing good. And I said, you need to turn him on his side and get his airway cleared out. He says, but he's, what if his neck's broke? I'll kill him. I said, if you can't breathe, you're going to kill him anyway. He needs to be able to breathe, clear out his airway. Well, about this time, I start to hear ambulances. But I can't figure out what on earth is taking him so long to get there. Man, what is taking them so long? I remember crying about that. Like, seriously, this is not good. And my neck hurt. Boy, did it hurt. The ambulances got there. And they loaded me in the back of the ambulance. And both my lungs collapsed on the spot. They life flighted me to the university hospital. On the way there, I died. I got to meet Jesus that night on Good Friday. He was the most beautiful, bright light I've ever seen in my life. Words can't even describe it. And the feeling to be in his presence was more glorious than anything I could have ever asked for or dreamed up. But he said, it's not your time to be here. You have to go back. I got work for you to do. 
So back I came. Nothing is more painful than leaving perfection and heaven and that being in his presence. Nothing is more painful and agonizing than being put back into your body that is broken, that is sinful, that is wretched, and that is being shocked with electric paddles. I saw them when I was going back into my body. It was not fun. It hurt. There was nothing enjoyable about it. Well, I spent about 11 days, 10, 11 days in ICU after that. I broke my neck in six places. I don't have one vertebrae at all on my neck anymore. My C6 and C7 pulled apart and switched places and shattering my C6. I told my mom and dad I'd be on a ventilator the rest of my life, that they need to start finding nursing homes for me to be in. Doctors don't know that God had plans for me. And it took a lot of work. I remember not being able to move. I remember feeling I was drowning all the time while they put a trach in my throat because I pulled out the vent tube so many times. I remember not being able to dress myself. I remember not being able to turn over into bed. I remember the pain and agony of the first nerve pain I felt, begging for it to stop. And in all that, I wouldn't change it, not one bit. I'm so thankful for what God has done for me. You know, my accident was on Good Friday. That's a night our Savior died for us. It was on Zion Road. The dwelling place of God is what that means. I was going to the dwelling place of God. I was going to the cross. And there I found our Lord, our Savior. Because we all went to the cross. Everybody who believes in Jesus went to the cross 2,000 years ago. When Jesus died on that cross, he looked forward to us. It's a gift. Something we didn't deserve. I didn't deserve life at that point, not the way I was living. I didn't deserve any of what I got. I don't deserve to be here. I don't deserve to spend the time with my kids. God's grace is what allows me to do that. God's grace is what allows me to be here with them. A day in and day out, I'm in a wheelchair and I will be for the rest of my life here on earth. You know, and I've had people tell me, well, if your God is so great and he heals people, why doesn't he heal you and make you walk? I look at him straight in the face. And without, usually without a blink, I don't miss a step. I said, well, if God can use me more in this wheelchair than he can use me up walking, then I'll be in this wheelchair. Because I know when I'm done, my life here on earth is done. I'll be walking forever. Let's think about it, people. My testimony wouldn't mean as much if I walked away. I wouldn't have the impact on people's lives that I do. If Jesus would make me stand up and walk, yeah, it would affect the people who know me now and the people who knew me then. But it wouldn't affect people who didn't know anything about me. And most of you wouldn't believe it anyway. But in my weakness, I am strong because God is my strength. He's the reason I get up every day. He's the reason we have life every day. I couldn't be more thankful for what he's done for me, the love he's given me. You know, there's times I stop and I think, you know, I feel like the Apostle Paul and I agonize because I spend most of my days in excruciating pain anymore because it's been 10 years now. But as I think about it, I always turn to that verse in Philippians 1. For me, living means to live for Christ and to dying is even better. And dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. I am torn between the two desires. I long to go be with Christ which is better, which is far better for me. But for your sakes, it is better that I continue to live. 
Now, I don't do this or put this video on here for anything that I get out of it. Because there is nothing. I honestly don't want my face out on the internet. But God told me I need to because it's his story, his work, his hand. Brothers and sisters, be encouraged that the place we go when this life is over is a million times better than this place is. You know, if I can just be in his presence for the rest of my life, that's all I want. All I want is to be with Jesus for forever. And if you don't know Jesus and you want to be able to say, how do I get to be in his presence forever? You got to repent. You got to turn from your sin. And even if you can't quit some things and you're not sure how, cry out to God. Ask for help. He helps those who ask. Accept Jesus as your Savior and Lord to make him not just the one who washes all your sin away, but to make him the Lord of your life, giving up your wants, your wills, your desire for his, to do his will because he has done so much for you. And then you thank him for it. You thank him for this new life because it is by faith that we are saved. Not of works lest any man should boast. Guys, Jesus is coming back soon. I know he is. We got work to do and times are going to get hard and the tests are going to get harder. Get firm in your faith. Stand firm. Get in the word. Know it forward and backwards because there are many slick tongue serpents out there. That can twist the scriptures around in a heartbeat. We got to get ready, people. We got to be ready. Jesus is coming back soon. And I struggle daily with things that God keeps pulling into my mind. That I got to get rid of. That I got to cast off. And absorb myself in his word. Praying to him. For if we don't pray, we can't know him. And I'm not talking to head knowledge, people. If you only know him in your head and you're not following him. If you've been walking with the Lord 10 years and ain't nothing changed, you need to check and make sure you know the Lord. Because I mean know Him in your heart, guys. Know Him. Have that relationship with Him. God wants relationship. To know Him like you know your best friend. To talk to Him. For He already knows everything about us. But how much about Him do we know? How much do you talk to Him? Spend so much time on Facebook and YouTube and Twitter, but we don't got no time to talk to God. Seriously, guys, we become obsessed. You spend so much time on video games, but we don't have time for God. He gave you life and the life he gives you is abundant. The more we are away from the attachments of this world, the more stuff we can do for him and it brings you more joy than anything that this world has to offer. This world entices you with, this is fun, this is fun, only to trap you in it. Same thing with drinking, drugs, and any kind of addiction. It appears to be fun for the moment, only to become a death trap that destroys every bit of your life and you don't even recognize who you are in the mirror later. I love you guys. I love you enough to tell you the truth. I love you enough to tell you that our country is in the worst shape I could ever imagine at the moment. That we need to repent. You know, God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah for their wicked and evil acts. So Christians, my brothers and sisters, get ready. Get ready. He's coming soon. We don't know when the rapture is going to happen. And if you don't believe in it, that's fine. You don't have to. I don't want to argue over it. We are brothers and sisters. We need to unite. We need to care for the poor, the sick, and the needy. You know, I don't have much, but I will gladly give the shirt off to my back to anybody who needs it. You know, it's not about me. It's about him. Everything we do is about him. Well, I love you guys. And... I pray God uses this to touch your heart and call you to him and strengthen your faith that you can know him and that he can do a marvelous thing in you because he is good, faithful, and just. He is merciful and loving and kind.
but we can't forget his justice, people. He is a just God. He has to punish sin somehow. All right, guys. Well, I might make another video at some point if God tells me there's something else I need to share. But if not, heaven's real, guys. Jesus is real. Judgment's coming. You need to be ready. Brothers and sisters, praise God. We have a Savior and we're going home soon. There ain't nothing this world can do to us to take that away. So you remember that. Don't forget that. Don't lose your confident hope. That no matter what this world does to us, why do you think all our Christian brothers and sisters in the Middle East that are being beheaded aren't saying, no, I don't want to do that. I'll, I'll, I'll turn. Because they know as soon as they die, they're going to be with Jesus. Can you blame them? I'm like, sign me up. I don't care. I'm not scared to death. I've been there. Hey, I, I'm ready. But until God calls me home, I've got work to do. And so do you guys. So keep it up. Keep up the good work. Keep testifying. Fill YouTube up with Jesus, man. Praise God and glory be to him forever and ever. Amen.